Good Friday. Literally, good Friday to everybody. How are you doing? What does it mean literally good Friday? Today is good Friday. I don't know what is good Friday. Jesus on the cross, good Friday. Ah, okay, okay, that, okay, okay. Yeah. It's okay, that good Friday. It's, okay, excellent. It's that good Friday. Everybody's off today. Not in the U.S. Everybody in the U.S. is still at work. Yeah, but, I was... Not uh, everybody. I was kind of depressed on Monday. Kind of, hey, I published a video like every Monday and kind of, hey, why only a fraction of people that normally watch videos watch it, no? And then uh, then I realized that my daughter is not in school this week and then I started connecting dots. Kind of, okay, so something is going on. Some holiday. I did yeah. not know which one it is until right now, but now I do yeah. know. Sunday is Easter, just in case you weren't sure. It's usually what follows Good Friday, always. Uh, Passover is tomorrow, so we have this big clump of of holidays right now. Yeah, and spring break, right? And that's where everything, schools around here started spring break last week. We have spring break starting again today. I had to go out and run a couple of errands first thing this morning, and all the schools were closed. All the medical offices were closed. But all the Walmarts and Targets were open. So we were still good. Uh, wow, we've got a lot of people here with us live. Ingen, good to see you. Uh, Sebastian, uh, do you want to try that? I, German is not my thing. Karfreitag. Okay, cool. I don't know, I'm inventing, I have no idea. <laughs> not everyone's still at work, yeah. <laughs> well, I know, and I, a lot of our, the people that I work with are in Spain, and Friday and Monday are holidays. Australia is the same way, so national yeah. holidays. In Stefan, Spain, the whole you? country this decided they're going to close all businesses kind of that's a countrywide yeah. decision right so friday and monday there's nothing to do in spain except sit at home and watch netflix right i don't know not friday and monday the whole week oh wow yeah i mean that's Spain, right kind of if you have one holiday in a week then people call it a bridge okay so i'm going to connect two weekends and put um, some extra days and there you go <laughs> and everybody's just <laughs> so here's here's a a uh, devastating story that might be funny. We just shipped for KubeCon uh, all the collateral material, right? Monday. And then FedEx is saying, yeah, we are going to return it back because uh, whomever is uh, your shipping company that is actually supposed to take it is not here. And they have no intention coming back <laughs> this whole week, kind of like they chose to close. So we don't know what to do with shipments. They should just send them to your house, right? Yeah, but officially I'm not allowed to do that. Because, oh. you know, import, uh, export, oh, stuff like that. I don't right, know. It's right, on right. a border control. You need to be the okay. one that is authorized. So know, it hasn't stuff. cleared that yet. Okay. If, yep. it, if it had cleared that, then sure, why not? Okay. Yeah, that's, but th that's the problem. The only one who can clear it is, is not decided not to work this week. Jude, good to hey, see Jude. you. Um, let's get into it. Man, that's just... I'm just not going to go there. Let's see. All right, so this week's podcast, I didn't even introduce ourselves, but you know what? I'm Darren. This is Victor. Victor, Victor, you're down below me right now. Huh? You're down here. You're just... I'm down there, yeah. Below I didn't there. do the normal introduction. We got started rambling about holidays. Um, this week's podcast... You probably don't remember it because we recorded it so long ago. But we're talking about reducing developer friction, and the next week's is a continuation of this. Uh, I'm leaning more and more. Hang on. <laughs> I'm going to bring this back out. This Mac Mini served me well. But if you haven't listened to the episode this week, I tried to come up with a phrase, and I could not remember the phrase of a thing to where in large companies 10, 15 years ago, they would just put this box on your machine, not a Mac Mini. Mac Mini had more power than the box. The box was called a thin client. That's what I couldn't remember. Yeah. Do you remember thin clients? Of course I do. Yeah. I think we should go back to those days. Yeah, that's except, uh, Chromebook. Ex yeah, but Chromebook except is that a thin client. The Chromebook's a thin client. My iPhone... 13 Pro Max is a thin client. It's also a very small client. 
Um, we should do those things. Nobody needs 32. Cloud. Okay, but all right, so everything should be cloud. But one thing we didn't go into, and let's talk about it for a minute. I mm -hmm. sort of touched on it. It's like some people want Linux, some people want Mac, some people want Windows. Mm -hmm. Now, where I work, we have people that run a mix. We have some people that are on Linux, some people on Mac, some people on Windows. And that's actually good because of this, the type of software that we create. That way we at least have normal coverage by developers all the time. But shouldn't every developer have access to all those platforms all the time? I mean, developers not? should have access to everything now. <laughs> I never understood that obsession uh, of big enterprise companies of trying to make developers more productive by giving them less access. Yeah. I, because I could see, I could be assigned a ticket that we haven't had this reported anywhere except on Windows. Well, if I'm a Mac or a Linux-based developer, I don't have any Windows, which is the truth for me right now. I wouldn't be able to be assigned that ticket. But with it being today, and the day is actually pretty slow, and all the people that could work on it are actually on vacation, but I could do it if I had a Windows machine, if we already had that set up as... I don't know. I, I got a little bit in, in th deeper thought on it this morning when I was running my errands and listening to the podcast. It's like... These, these aren't simple problems to solve, but they are problems that can be solved, right? The, but that's, I think that that's the appeal of cloud, be it for, uh, as a way to run servers or uh, to run uh, development environments, right? You have a team that is dedicated on maintaining specific service, right? That you consume, whatever the service is, and they know how to do it, and they uh, and they're very effective because they actually cater many, many, many different users. It's much more effective for me to go. It's much easier for me to go to AWS and say, "Give me a VM," than to start figuring it out, how, figuring out how to create a VM myself. Right? I doubt that anybody would say, "No, actually, it's easier to create a VM myself." Yeah. I doubt that there is a person for, now. For why not apply that same logic to almost everything else? Hey, uh, I need this environment. I just go to some service and get that environment or whatever else you need. Yeah. The Sorry only for... reason why I still have a strong machine is because video editing is still, to my knowledge, not really. And you know, the whole producing material, recording and stuff like that. That's, yeah. That must be local as far as I know. But if it wouldn't be that, I would be running the cheapest possible MacBook right now. Whatever is the cheapest possible. Yeah. The video editing, I think, can go to cloud. It's a little more challenging, but it depends on what type of software you want to run. I mean, if you're willing to, it doesn't matter. That, that's an odd use, not an odd use case, but it's not a normal use case for most of our people. That's the thing, right? Uh, it's extremely important for me to be productive, right? So when you say that's doable, that's not good enough, right? It needs to be better, right? It cannot be even the same as on local machine. It needs to be better. And many of the services are better than if you run them yourself. But some of the things I do are still not. That's the only problem. Yeah. Let's take a look at a couple of comments. Uh, everyone wants a cloud platform developer, platform cluster, boy, that's a lot of slashes if they can build it themselves. Uh, that's exactly. I mean, but that's, that's the silliness, you know. Uh, we all think that we can do it ourselves. We are clever. We can do this. We can do that. It's the same thing. I remember, I don't know if, if you were in such meet, meetups and meetings and what's or not conversations. You know, first couple of years of Docker, I was I, I cannot explain how many sessions I attended where people explaining how, oh, the, I can do it myself. You know, Alex, see this and that. I, that is absolutely, it's silly for me to use Docker, right? I can do it myself. Uh, and then sufficient time passed and then people stopped doing that. Uh, and by sufficient time passed, I mean Docker matured, right? 
and removed all the reasons for anybody to use, not to use it at that time. Same thing goes for, for other things. People want to build platforms themselves uh, for two reasons. First, to show that how great they are. And that's okay because you spend a year and then you realize that you cannot do it yourself. Uh, and second, because there might not be valid alternatives yet. That's the, the second reason is the real reason, the real problem. And usually that second problem is people are just a little too far ahead of the market. No, I not always say that. No, well, I, no, no, I'm going to, I'm going to fight you on this one. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people have been going to all the conferences and seeing all of the cool stuff and figured, well, we can just do this. But they don't have enough foundation yet, whether a technical foundation to build on top of, or they don't have enough foundation mentally yet to actually build something like that. There, I agree. But there is one more extremely important uh, thing. Not enough manpower. Because <laughs> let's say that you see a project and you say, hey, I can, why would I use this? I can do it myself. Uh, let's say that we go back in time 10 years, kind of like, oh, I can do something scheduling myself. And I've, I've heard and seen a lot of examples like that. And maybe you can, but that's not the question. The question is, can you keep up yourself the same pace as an open source project with a lot of companies, contributions and stuff like that, right? So the real question is not whether you can do it to make it in the same state as something else that you might pick off the shelf. The real question is, can you keep up the pace? And the answer in majority of cases, unless you're Google, Netflix, or one of those, the answer is no, you cannot. That I'll agree with. And if there is yeah. something missing, like, hey, yeah, I don't want to use X because uh, this specific thing that I need is missing, so I'm going to build it all over from scratch, from scratch myself, so that I get that missing thing. Hey, make a pull request, contribute. Do not build yourself something from scratch only because there is something missing in a project that is otherwise that otherwise fits your needs. The uh, so let me get a couple of others. Boaz, good to see you, New York City. Okay. That's where my sister is. Uh, Stefan says, my last job I had a thin client to access the personal VM, and it was very strange. It is very strange until you get used to it, and then it's just normal, right? Once you, yeah, once you had to do it. Um, let's see. Okay, here, let's, let me, or right, I'll mention this. What is this? If I have a Windows machine in the age of VMs and subsystems for Linux. Um, some people still need Windows because that's the software they're running. Fair and enough. writing. Yeah, that's, okay. I understand that. To be honest, I'm sick of trying to, I mean, that, what I'm going to say happened years ago. Um, I got sick of trying to make Linux work and really, really well on my laptops. So if for some reason you don't like Mac Windows, why not? Now that it has subsystem for Linux. Right. I would um, probably choose Windows over Linux today. Oh, absolutely. I guess. Without, from a usability perspective, yes. If all I need is terminal, then okay, maybe not. But yeah, how often is that? Really true. Um, let's go ahead and answer Seth's question while we're here, because this is sort of a friction question. If you're starting with crossplane today, where do you start? Okay, so if that question would come a month or two months from now, then I would say on the official website, uh, because uh, a new person dedicated to polish the documentation uh, just joined the team. Uh, so the docs will be much better very, very soon. But if the question is not in the near future, but today, then DevOps Toolkit channel, and then for more advanced topic, up down, upbound channel. In both cases, I'm publishing there. It's just that now, now I switch cross-plane content to upbound. So DevOps Toolkit upbound, search for those two channels. You'll find a lot of material. Can you read this? Dobar dan. Somebody more or less speaks Serbian or Croatian or something like that. Okay. Thank you for the content and the rest, okay. rest is understandable. Okay. 
good because I I see the middle now, so I can see I can see the meat and cheese in the middle. I can't understand the two pieces of bread. So, <laughs> okay, um, I'll go with Boaz here. Many legacy industries out there have a huge fr- footprint on prem for various reasons, and still will always have on prem for another decade or two, or potentially longer, or go bankrupt. <laughs> Uh, well, it would still take yes. them that long to go bankrupt because... So, so here's the problem is that kind of attempts to make on-prem great stopped, right? We had OpenStack years ago. That's largely considered completely abandoned, right? And I don't work that much with on-prem, so what I'm going to say might be wrong, but I don't think that there is... A, new OpenStack on Horizon, right? I'm not sure. I don't think, well, Kubernetes would be the new OpenStack. Yeah, but Kubernetes right. is still kind of like that. That's still Kubernetes. That does not solve yeah. how do you manage the whole data center, right? There's more than right. Kubernetes. Right. And OpenStack solved that. OpenStack, yeah. the idea, not the implementation necessarily, but the idea was, hey, you can have AWS like something in your data center. It Correct. never worked. So, but mm. there was that idea. Yeah. Right. And uh, it's as if nobody's trying to, that would be interesting. That would be even potentially amazing business. Somebody making well, open stack. The cloud right. providers are doing that, right? With their basically entry point into the cloud. It's not the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. If you're trying yeah, to keep everything right. inside of four walls, then. Yeah, OpenStack, I think, is still the closest thing to even come yeah. to do that. Um, I'll go here. If I think VMware is trying to use Kubernetes APIs to do what OpenStack for, did for on-prem. Yeah. And with what yes. Boas says here, my, my point is the industries are slowly moving to cloud. Yes, slowly being the key word. Uh, if you, oh, yeah. But once the migration is done, do you need to know it anymore? Because what's going to happen is when people start migrating from the cloud back to on-prem, which has been happening. But it's it's not only that, right? It's there is a value in understanding a bit lower level than the high level that cloud is offering you, right? And many people who started their careers in cloud might not understand those things, right? The same way as I can go the same way as I would say that for any programmer, learning C is extremely useful, even if you're never going to write C. I don't know whether that's where the comment is going, but uh, if that if that's the direction it's going, kind of like that you learn a bit lower level that will help you uh, later on with cloud, I agree. Okay. Uh, Karen, good hey. to see you. Uh, let me go back to one question here. Is there a hello world for cross-plane? Yes, there is in the official documentation, quick start, hello world okay. equivalent. Yeah. All right. And to Scott, is there a theme for the questions? No, we've just rambled all over the place. <laughs> Normally on Fridays, we're just talking about whatever the news of the week is. And we've sort of gone down the rabbit hole of what this week's podcast was about. Yeah. But we, let's move in. Next Thursday, we have AMA. AMA so, over on the DevOps Toolkit channel, not this channel, yeah. but the other channel. Um, who's the guest on that one? Chris. Well, I forgot um, the name. My, my memory is terrible. But uh, so guest is interesting to uh, next week, uh, not because of what he does and how he does it, but uh, I mean, that's very actually very interesting. You'll see. But it's one of the listeners of the, of the channel, uh, people who join the channel, they ask, say, hey, can I join the AMA? And the answer is yes. And the same answer comes to anybody else. If anybody else wants to join, be live, please do. Just let, let us know. Okay. Um, let's get into some acquisitions this week. This one came out of nowhere to me. Did you see this one? Uh, yes, I saw it. Perforce buys Puppet. Yeah, I 
I mean, other than them being two legacy type companies, I don't see where they fit. Right? Yeah. I mean, I mean, Perforce, great SCM for what it is. It has a very specific use case and it excels at that use case. Puppet is very good at what it does. But marrying yes. an SCM, primarily SCM tool, and a infrastructure as code tool, does that, do you consider Puppet IAC? Reasonable. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, right, it's close enough. I don't think that there is a really big difference between configuration no. management and Confi okay, config management. Okay, config management. That's yeah. yeah, okay. But I'm trying to I tried to figure out where these two come together. They don't. The, I don't know the numbers, but the puppet was bought for uh, I don't know a cent on a dollar or whatever the expression is. Yeah. Kind of puppet is a it's and it's kind of sad, right? Uh, it makes you depressed in a way that Puppet is one of those, Puppet and Chef, I'm going to put them in the same group, are one of those tools that change the industry, literally change the industry. I, we, would, we would be doing things very differently today in a worse way if it wasn't for those tools. And everybody adopted them, everybody used them. We all change how we see certain aspects of our systems and how we operate them, but it couldn't keep up. Now, I will bring this up, what Ingen says, is Puppet still a thing? Yes, Puppet is still a real thing. It, for many places, going back to what Boaz was saying earlier, for these on-prem plays, Puppet or Chef, is those two are the right answer in those scenarios, I think. A Ansible's fine in that, but I so, tend to like having the bake a little bit further than Ansible. So here's the thing, right? If, if you're an early adopter of something, if you're on the cutting edge, then you run a risk of getting stuck with that something. Right? It's extremely expensive or when operating on large scale to switch from one tool to another. Extremely expensive. So many of the companies who are stuck with Puppet today are the companies who were actually in front of others in that area in the past. Kind of companies who adopted Puppet when that was a thing, right? And the same thing happens with, this is not Chef and Puppet Rumble, right? The same thing will hap happens with uh, large enterprises or large systems adopting any tool. Once you adopt it, it's extremely hard to move away. Yep. So we should probably talk to our friend at Puppet and see what he thinks. Yeah. He's you mean still there. Friend of, our friend at Perforce? True. <laughs> <laughs> well, to be acquired, so I'm assuming that it hasn't closed yet, so I'll still say Puppet for the moment. Um, this next one, though, Docker acquires longtime partner InfoSifter. Did you even know they were using I don't using know what this is. Exactly. I didn't either. <laughs> it was built in 2010, so it's 12 years old. It's so far deep in the back. Okay, so InfoSifter is for information aggregation and filtering products. So anyway, blah, blah, blah. This was written by the InfoSifter person. Um, trying to find it. So now... I can't even find it, but it was basically, they, they power a lot of the things behind Docker Hub, I believe is how I read it. I read this a few days ago, so I don't remember exactly. Um, so anyway, Docker bought somebody. Uh, okay. <laughs> I don't know what they do, so maybe it's a good thing. Maybe it's a bad thing. I don't know. Hey. I don't know. Uh, Sort of in the same area, Kubernetes 124 got pushed out. Did you read about this? Oh, no, I'm not following anymore, kind of. Uh, for a while now, I'm more interested on, on projects on top of Kubernetes than Kubernetes itself, to be honest. Yep, so it got pushed out until May 3rd. 
It was supposed to be this week. I believe it was release week. Because there's some things happening structurally. So if you're expecting to have 124 and you're ready to say sayonara to Dr. Shem, you have to wait a couple more weeks. <laughs> No, hardly anybody adopts uh, switches, upgrades Kubernetes that fast anyway. So for the majority of people, it will yeah. not be even noticeable. Not a big deal. Um, let's go back to here real quick. What about moving from one cloud to another? This goes back to our earlier conversation. Never saw I, it. I have. You did? Absolutely. I've seen people move from, painfully, from AWS to GCP. Okay. I have okay. seen that happen. I have seen people move from GCP to AWS. I've seen people move from Azure to AWS. Notice the direction I'm not saying. I'm not saying to Azure. <laughs> um, but these, I mean, it does happen. It doesn't happen as often as some people would like you to think. I think that's the key part. Yeah, I mean, uh, now when I think about it, I did, I, I do know for quite a few cases where that moved, but those that I know were all related with money. You know, uh, AWS uh, sometimes gives you as a startup significant amount of money in credits, and then it dries off, and then you go to Google or something like that. Um, but yeah, somebody probably moves. Yes. What is, I think, more important is not about, not that much about moving from AWS to GCP or whatever, right? It's more about recognizing that certain parts of the system or certain type of applications or services or what's or not are better run here and other somewhere else, right? Now, that, that combination I've seen a lot, kind of, oh, machine learning in Google and uh, something else in AWS. That's, yeah. But that's not really strictly moving. It's more like diversifying. Let me go ahead and answer this one too. Um, what about remote work versus working from office? Do you think we're done with going to the office? No. Uh, do you advocate your companies for remote work or are you more of an office person? My company's fully remote. Victor, how, how remote fully is remote. your company? Fully remote. Yep. I've got friends that are fully office. I have friends that were fully office prior to um, prior to everything started in March 2020. And there it was their company's belief that an off that work can only happen in the office between the hours of 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. local standard time, whatever local standard time was. No work could happen outside of those eight hours a day. And then March 2020 happened, and guess what? <laughs> they have gone from being a $4 billion company to anywhere between a 6 and $8 billion company. I'm saying well B, done. billion. Yeah. And fully remote. And fully remote. And all the exec team have basically been living in RVs going around the country. I mean, and guess what? What could... They're all going back to office in September. Really? That's curious. It's very and curious to me. How big of a rejection there is. It'll be interesting to see what happens. Because it, I believe it was this week that Apple went back fully in office. Or not, excuse me, this was not, not fully in office, but this was the, the first week to where you had to be in the office one day a week. And then in a few weeks, it's going to be two days a week. And then in a few weeks, it's going to be three days a week. But what's going to happen to talent that, okay, well, I've been doing my job. I've been outperforming for the past two years. And now you're saying I need to get on 101 and drive to the donut. And I, I think they're going to be, I think people that are forcing people back to office are going to be losing the talent that don't want to be in the office anymore. Period. Exactly. I mean, I'm going to exclude from that kind of case, you know, Apple's and Google's of the world because they're really special. But for the majority of other people, companies, if you go back 100% in office, expect, um, accept, 
expect that a uh, certain percentage of people will leave. Now, I'm not advocating that everybody should be remote, just to clarify. I'm just advocating that there should be a choice and that after years in COVID, you cannot force people to go to the office. You can offer them to go to the office, but not force, which is a very different thing, right? I know quite a few people who actually cannot wait to go back to the office, but that we are not going back to the times when that is mandatory, unless you're a special kind of like a company in a part of a country where actually there is no competition, so people don't have a place to go, or Google, or something like that. But outside of that, because you know what's happening when, uh, I don't know uh, where you work, Darin, but in my company, when we hear that some, some company that uh, has people that are potentially interesting for us, when we hear back to the office, we send people email. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there is a strong chance that you're thinking about quitting the company after this announcement. How about you come and work for us? Yeah, I mean, everybody's life is different. It's just me and my wife. We have a house. We're not living in 400 square feet. I, you know, I don't ever need to go to an office. I don't even live near an office. The closest office to me is three and a half or three hours away from me. I'll never go to an office. Uh, there is also another interesting thing is that before COVID, quite a few people moved to a different city, different country uh, because of work, right? Oh, there are so many opportunities in Silicon Valley. Oh, there are so many opportunities in France instead of uh, Spain or whatever the combination is, right? And now with COVID, that most of the companies moved remote, people decided that actually, no, I don't want to live in San Francisco, or I mean, I'm using San Francisco as an example, whatever, right? And uh, went somewhere else. And it will be very hard to convince people that, hey, now you actually need to, because we are forcing everybody to be in the office, you need to be in this specific location. Very hard. Yeah, and I think that's what Ingen's saying here. In what we do, you don't need to be in the office. I think I think that's going to be true, but I'm going to take the, the IT phrase there for just a second because we talked a little bit about it in this week's podcast. If your office actually has people working in it, not like normal HR, just normal working people that are using computers, if you are IT, let's say help desk, then somebody help desk needs to be there because people are going to have problems. So you're going to have to have the level one, level two help desk people there. It's just going to have to be there. Now, does it need to be the same person every day or could they rotate it out? Okay, hopefully you have enough people to where you could do that. But, man. There is a difference between having to be in specific location because from practical perspective, you simply have to be there. And being in specific location simply because somebody thinks that you are incapable to work unsupervised from your home. That's very different, right? I'm not advocating that people working in supermarkets should be working remote, right? Because you obviously need to be, you're a cashier, right? You need to be in that place. I think there is nothing wrong with it. But yes, for what we do, vast majority of people in our industry, really, there is no difference. Let me get through a couple other items here real quick. Uh, okay, let's go. Cosine is now inside Harbor. Yeah. So I think that's where everybody's going to end up at at some point in the near future. In Harbor? So? Me, no. In, cosine is going to be buried inside of every registry. Yes. I, I think that's just going to be... If the registry doesn't support Cosine, I won't be using that registry. Right. Correct. Tw 12 to 18 months. I'm, I'm giving it, or maybe even 24 months, somewhere in that ballpark. It's a I, cycle, right? That yep. uh, you get something that is widely adopted and cosine is one of those things. And then if somebody has a brilliant idea how to make that part of the work better, then that somebody needs to build on top of cosine, not anymore replacing it. Yep. So congratulations to the people at SigStore and Chingard and everybody else that has to do with cosine, getting it buried in a registry, that's a big deal. That's that's the first big step, I think. Um, we talked last week 
about Charm. We'd actually covered Charm quite a while back. And you're getting ready to build a CLI. We won't go into the, the math on that. But I wanted to go ahead and put this in today's show because they go through how to build interactive CLIs with Bubble Tea, which is part of the whole Charm ecosystem. And I thought it was pretty good. It just it walks you through how to, how to do it. And it even gets into Cobra and the whole nine yards. So if you're if you've been curious about okay, how can I build a CLI? You all have talked about charm. I don't really understand that. This one post, which by the way, all the links for everything today will be down in the description of the video, probably tomorrow, sometime, sometime Saturday, the whatever date that is, 16th. So I wanted to go ahead and include this as a good because if you look up in the right-hand corner here, it's really small. It's a really long post. That's absolutely amazing because this is solving the biggest problem in Bubble Tea. Docs are horrible. Yeah. I kind of, I, I really, I suffered a lot going through it, trying to figure out things because you need to figure it out yourself. This is really, really cool. Yeah. And sort of in parallel with this, but not related to this, and this is from Ingest. I don't. I never got beyond this point. I never even looked at the site. I don't know what else they do. I don't care because they have this one blog post. But I found another repository today called BOA. And what it's doing, and I haven't compared like A, B, the, these together, but you can include BOA along with Cobra, and then basically this is what it turns into. So it will give you the help in context and show you everything from a bubble tea perspective. Now you might be asking, why don't you just create a web interface and be done with it? Well, I don't want a web interface. I want a CLI or in this case, a TUI. But, but we're going back to our VT 100 days with this or whatever terminal, physical terminal you were using 40 years ago now. You know, K9S, and I'm not saying that they're the first, they proved that actually you can have a rich user interface Yep. in the terminal. To me, that was the proof. Yep. So anyway, I think between this, I've got to get through two edits this weekend because I missed an edit last weekend. I want to go through both of these because I've, I've, I've had an idea for a CLI that I want to build for doing some audio processing. And this would be how I want to, because there's a couple of switches and stuff that I need. And this would be pretty cool to do. Nice. Uh, another thing was, I don't know how to say it. It is part of CNCF. I'm going to call it Kaploy. <laughs> I don't know. It's probably KD replaced with K. -E, I don't know. Type yeah, of... key, key ploy. I don't know. Generate test cases and mocks from API calls. Their, their claim to fame here is, I don't think it was here, it was somewhere else. They are testing themselves with themselves and they got automatically, without writing one line of code, 75% code coverage. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you're talking about mocks, that sounds absolutely amazing. Yep. Uh, if you're talking about text, tests, call me old fashioned, but I don't believe in the usefulness of high test yep. coverage auto generated. I, I don't believe in that. Might be the time too old though. Yeah. For mocks, amazing. For mocks, Absolutely yeah. So amazing. auto mock dependency. Basically it takes it takes more time to write mocks than tests. I how do I say this? Without censoring myself. I despise mocks with a passion, especially when I have an endpoint that just works. I'm, I want to use the endpoint. I just don't like mocks. I have never liked mocks, but there is a legitimate reason for mocks. I get it. I don't like them, but according to this, you record whatever it is that you're doing. It captures it all and then generates the mocks that you need. I, it seems pretty cool. I, you know, I, it's, uh, I'm guessing it's going to be a service at some point. Uh, I like this. No need to write test cases. No need to come. Okay. Whatever. Um, but 
I'm guessing it's part of CNCF. I didn't actually go through the, the depths of it. Let's see here. Uh, they are part of continuous integration and delivery here. Let's see what it says. Um, are they donated or just members? That's curious. I don't know. Let's see. What am I looking for? K-Ploy. They're K-ploy. here. K-Ploy. Uh, there we are. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah, I think that that means that they donated. Okay. That's what I can't tell. Or maybe not. I'm not sure. Open source. It's impossible to navigate the CNCF. Okay. Well, let's let's go with Jenkins here because I know what I'm trying to find something. Okay. That's Linux Foundation Project because I know that's true. So let's take a look at this. Maybe not. Maybe uh, they've just got listed. Yeah, maybe not. Because now when I look at th- that list, definitely does not contain only CNCF donations. Right. Because Jenkins is not CNCF project, uh, or uh, or Telius is not CNCF project, and so on and so forth. Right. So this Spinnaker, is a well, list Spinnaker's of members, Linux probably. Foundation. Yeah, so Linux Foundation project. Yeah. Yeah, so this is the landscape. This is not yeah, the landscape. Not the projects. Okay. Yeah. So that's sort of a misnomer. I don't know what it means by... Let me go back here. Anyway, nothing against them. Just trying to figure out what they were. There we go. We're back to this. So anyway, could be interesting. Um, two more quick tools here. Harpo. I thought this was cool. It's a CLI. Mm-hmm. Good. CLI that allows me to manage secrets in Azure, AWS, and GCP. So no matter how I want to store my secrets, I have a single tool that will do it for me for all the big three. Nice. I think that's pretty cool. Plus, he does live stream on Twitch and YouTube for when he's writing it. Cool. That's really cool. Makes me want to watch it. Okay, that's Harpo. And then the last one, and I'll get back over to the questions here in just a second. Mass code. I saw this, I can't remember which site I found it on. It's like Snippets Lab and Quiver, but it's open source. So it allows you to keep what snippets. It's, well, that's exactly, because I didn't know either. It's, a, it's basically a specific, it, it is, the way I'm going to say it, it's like Notion or Evernote for code. Mm. because it's got specific, it handles languages by using Ace Editor. Ace Editor is smart enough to understand languages. So it will color code and do those kinds of things. I did load it up. I'm not going to show it because I didn't set up any examples. But I don't know if, how how far can I go here? Let's see. Uh, Let's go one more. Nope. So basically it's a for TypeScript, log memory usage, and then just here's a snippet of code. But when I see things like this, nothing against it, and this is not a bad a bad idea, I don't know how to copy code around. Number one, if you're writing code within four walls, legally you shouldn't be able to copy that code and take it with you. So there's an exfiltration mm-hmm. issue potentially there that's bad. Um, I don't know. Yeah. And isn't that what GitHub something something is giving you in a more intelligent way now? You mean like gist? Or you talking? No, 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 you're talking no, about no. the um. Uh, discussions. My brain stopped. Is it discussions? I mean, basically, it, it gives you it gives you intelligent autocomplete. Basically, it writes oh, code for you. No, not this. This is basically just like Evernote, to where you paste things in. That's all it is. Like paste an empty, so that you can, uh, you copy there so that you can paste it somewhere else. Correct. Ah, okay, okay, gist. Okay, now I get it. To share this, in a way, right? Yes, but this isn't shareable. This is standalone. <laughs> it's self-contained. Okay, I'm confused. <laughs> it's like <laughs> Evernote uh, without okay. the web backend, or it's like it's more like whatever you want. Just think of anything that normally has a web backend or a data backend that yeah. there is no back. There is no remote backend. It's all local. I guess it's I guess it's something for somebody. It's cool. It actually works really nice. It's very it's it's very usable, but I couldn't make heads or tails of it. I'd have to work through it some more. 
And then let's get to your video for this week on mutable and immutable. And you said everybody was on vacation, so nobody watched it. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Uh, you had 2,800 exactly. views. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, it's, it's not bad, but it's supposed to be like 10K so far. Um, yeah, it's, um, it's one what of those prompted, cases. What prompted this? Questions. Did you get a, questions? Okay. Yeah, kind of like uh, I, I get every day a bunch of questions. And uh, I usually answer with uh, putting it on my to-do list. And this was one of the questions that repeated a lot. So I bumped it up in my to-do list and did a video. Uh, it's kind of, you know, it's one of those things that I often forget how, you know, what, what majority of people understands and what doesn't. Um, and uh, I, uh, not long ago, uh, short while ago, I re realized kind of, hey, people do not really understand yet what is immutable and what is mutable, really. So it explains it. Should we have picked better words? When, when people chose immutable and mutable, should, we, should different words sh should have been chosen? You mean words that are easier to distinguish? Yeah. Yeah. Like you can change yeah, this, you can't now, change this. Yeah, but now you know you're 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 already talking about changing English language, right? I know. It, instead of mutable, it's mutable, it would be it could be changeable, unchangeable, but it's still very similar. Right. Anyway. That was um that was the week. Let's let me catch back up because We've had a lot of interactions today. Um, let me see here. Let's, let's do this one because I saw this one twice. You can name one tool that offers the best and easiest developer workflow for programming and debugging microservices. What would it be and why? VS Code? VS Code or <laughs> VS Code or Vim, one or the other. And it's Yeah, I mean, VS Code uh, through plugins, you can extend it to do anything, really, yeah. including debugging. Yeah, many, many not, different yeah. variations of debugging. Yeah, unfortunately, I think that's, for today, that's true. Um, so I said, I changed jobs to ensure fully remote, got better pay and benefits too. Yep, pretty true. Actually, very true. Some companies hired more than the workspace they have. Going back to the office would mean a lot of rejection. Oh, interesting. Meet a lot of rejection. Okay. Not that yeah. it would meet. It is meeting a lot of rejection. But the kind people are starting to go to back. Go to Twitter and see the oh, reactions yeah. on going back to the office. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. Uh, this was in context to Cosine. I hope JFrog does it. With Cosine being fully open source and being a very permissive license, I think. What were they? Do you remember? I don't remember. I think it. I think it was Apache or. It was either Apache, Apache or I'm. I'm looking up over here on the other side here, real quick. Um, Cosine is. I mean, it's 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 CNCF project, so it must be fully. Uh, it couldn't enter foundation if it's That's true. not fully open. It's Apache. I couldn't yeah. remember if it's Apache or MIT. Um, the uh, and this is pretty funny too. Imagine K9S rewritten with bold he. But it would look more or less the same. Basically, About what same. Bubble Tea gives you is uh, libraries, basically, that allows you to do something similar to, among other things, that uh, KNNS does. It would look similar, I think. Uh, yeah. What was it? Was it previous week that you showed a tool that uh, we discovered during the show that it was uh, written in? Was it something GitHub? Oh, it was the GitHub. That was last week's show. Um, yeah. It was a GitHub plug, a, a plugin, plugin, a plugin for the GitHub CLI. I can't yeah. remember what the name of it was, but, but yeah, it looked pretty K9ish, K9ish, yep. -ish, right? Yep. And we looked um, at the code, and bubble. sure enough, yeah, we, we clicked into the code, and there was bubble tea right in the right in the middle of it. So, like, you know, the the thing I need, still need with bubble tea, it's very low level. I was so impressed. I spent a week kind of like. Focused only on bubble tea. It's absolutely amazing, but very low level. 
I think he still needs, that's why I get so excited with the project that you showed today, kind of like, we still need a bit more than, than, than bubble tea, I think, to make it uh, more adoptive. Okay. That being said, yeah. I could never do the same thing what I do with bubble tea without, so I'm not complaining, right. it's better than without, just not yet there. Yeah. Uh, mocks are good when they're provided by the team that provides the actual service, yes. <laughs> that, that, that's absolutely true. That's the only way actually it can really work. Uh, this is my service and part of it is to provi provide mocks so that whomever depends on that service can use it. Because it's almost ridiculous to start creating mocks uh, for the service that depends on them instead of the service that uh, is based on them. Yeah, what he's saying here is writing a mock exactly. for something you don't own is a bad idea. I had never really thought about that. I'm glad you said that because if you're providing a real service, you should also provide a mock. That would make too much part sense. Of the release, yeah. That's a good idea. Especially since, look, you probably need those mocks to test your own service. Maybe not in exactly the same form, but when you do test for your work, you need to generate mocks for yourself, for your own app, right? And it's just about wrapping those mocks and maybe investing a bit more work to make them usable for everybody else. That's a good idea. Uh, Scott has a question. What about Pact instead of Kapoi? Same type of tool? Have you ever heard of Pact? I have no idea. I have no idea either. Let me see. Pull it up over I here. know packed with K between C and T, but that's a publishing house. Oh, yeah, different. Um, I'm not even finding anything. Uh, you cannot search only packed. That's, uh, no. Okay. Uh, I don't know. Let's see. Or right, packed deployment. Probably packed IO. That looks like a uh, thing here. Let's see what it is. Okay, you found it. I'm not You're that a resourceful person. I'm not that crazy. Let's see what it says. Come on. These stupid React sites. Look, people, a marketing site does not need to be React. Fast and easy, reliable way for integrating web apps, APIs, and microservices. Open source. Say goodbye to end-to-end -end testing. Um, never heard of it. Then Scott, I don't know. I have no yeah, idea. I haven't used either of the two, so yeah, I don't know either. Okay, um, what's your take on certifications? Worth the time and money? Do you want to go first? Yeah. So if you do not have um, experience that can be validated, it's great. Right? You know, kind of if you don't have ten years of experience, it's something working experience then certifications are great because they give you starting point, right? Kind of like, I do not have experience yet, but I'm certified, which is much better than I do not have experience yet. And uh, for some people, it is very positive as a learning method, right? Um, so I, I still believe that if you talk about, hey, I've been 10 years in this industry, certificate is something that will actually give you better job I don't, I don't think that that's, that, that's happening. And uh, as a matter of fact, if somebody would offer me, uh, somebody, if, if a company would offer better conditions, more money for somebody with 10 years experience because he's certified, I would say don't go there. Don't go to that company. Uh, but inexperienced people or as a way to learn something, I think it's great. Yep, that's my my take on it too, which is an opposite take from 20 years ago, 25, 30 years ago. It made sense to have it. Question from Daniel, how to best communicate that this is a good question. How to best communicate the value of an internal developer platform to non-technical people? Any recommendations or keys to success? Um, I if if it's the the person that has to fund it, Oh. So it's, that's the only non-technical person I would talk to is the funder. Nobody else. It shouldn't matter to anybody else, right? 
simply it's if you're the person creating the internal developer platform uh, the explanation to non-technical people is easy that's a way for me to stop being a blocker in my company that's the explanation my work is blocking other people from doing their work if i instead of reacting and creating servers deploying applications whatever you're doing if i can create a service so that people can do that a lot of time will be saved by people not waiting for me anymore yeah i yeah I mean, see. it's the same argument kind of like uh, what's the value in using AWS instead of setting up everything yourself? And ignore now the cost of AWS, right? Same value. You can have it in minutes instead of weeks or months. Exactly. I want a VM. Yeah. There, there, so option number one, I want a VM, go to AWS, click a button, you get a VM. Option number two, uh, Purchase a server, uh, set it up, install VMware or whatever on top of that server, uh, spend seven weeks uh, trying to configure it and what's or not, and then you create a VM. Yeah. Um, let's see. Do you have a meeting to go to in a few minutes? No. You're done? Okay. Nobody um, wants me. Okay, good. Uh, let's go and get through. I think we've got two left here. Um, Scott was VS Code, yeah. Intercept tool. I guess it's intercept between. I don't do that kind of stuff. I don't know. Do you? Yeah, I mean, the tool that I use is uh, Teleport and mm -hmm. Code Zero. Both are great. Okay. Really, teleport is kind of more established. So, yeah. You have less chance of making a wrong choice by, but code zero is also up and coming. So right. we might want to check about. Okay. Um, Jude asked, what's your take on K6? Well, we uh, had Nicole on last week yeah. on DevOps Toolkit, well, last Thursday, whatever date that was, the for 14th, 7th. And then she's going to be on the podcast in June, I think. I think that's when her episode is going to come out. So, Exactly. K, the, the short of K6? Thumbs up. Way thumbs up. It's really um, cool. It's, yeah. It's, it's easy to use. It's not, it's not JMeter. It's not Gatling. For, good, for the good reasons of those. Um, okay, I think that's it, because I actually do need to, I have a meeting in two minutes, so I do need to go. Uh, before you leave, if you don't mind, go ahead and give us a thumbs up, and if you haven't subscribed, go ahead and subscribe. Podcast will be out on Wednesday at 6 a.m. Eastern. I don't remember what it is. It's already been edited, and it's a follow-on to what we talked about this week with, what did we talk about this week? Do you remember? Oh, yeah. Uh, Reducing idea. developer friction. That's what it was. Oh, I remember what it's about. Um, yeah, so it's, a, it's sort of a continuation of that. And then uh, next Thursday, so that'll be Wednesday, 6, 6 a.m. Eastern. Next Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. CET, we have an AMA over on DevOps Toolkit, which in the if you look scroll back up in the chat, Victor put a link to that channel there. Don't ask us the reasoning why we have different channels for different things. It's a too long of a conversation for now. <laughs> uh, and then next Friday, we should be back here. <coughs> as long as everything stays according to plan. So Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And uh, you have your video coming out on Monday. And Tuesday, you get to have a day off. So. Lucky well, me. Not you. Them. Not. not ah, day. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, I don't care about that. <laughs> uh, thanks everyone for being with us live today if, if you are with us live if you watched the replay to the end thanks for hanging out and uh, we will catch you again next week multiple times in multiple forms go have a good weekend and uh, we'll see you next week <laughs>